Hello, everybody. My name is Bryce Wakefield, and I'm the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. We've got a great program for you today with a live audience here in uh, the ACT. Um, and because we are in the ACT, I will turn things over now to Lisa Studart, who is the Secretary of the Australian American Association, with whom we're partnering. Very glad to partner with the American, uh, the Australian American Association today to do the welcome to country or the acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Bryce. And good morning, everybody. And can I acknowledge on the screen, we have Ambassador Sinodinas and we'll be talking to you soon, very soon, Ambassador. I was just recalling to Bryce, I was Chief of Staff to Ambassador Sinodinas for about five minutes once when we were in a transition uh, between ministers. So it's lovely to see you there, Ambassador. Can I start, please, by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people uh, that we meet on their lands here today in Canberra? And I know many of the guests um, on Zoom meet on the lands of traditional owners, both here in Australia and in the United States. And I know we want to acknowledge their long-standing traditions and connection to country and to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And of course, to acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here in Australia or Indigenous Americans uh, who would be joining us in the United States. It's a great honour to be on your lands. I'm here as the Secretary of the Australian American Association Canberra Division. We're a small community-based group that seek to continue the tradition of our association, which this year is celebrating its 60th anniversary. And we had a wonderful event just two weeks ago at the Commonwealth Club uh, with on the, on the actual date of Thanksgiving uh, and we had about 75 people there celebrating that very uh, prestigious uh, occasion, uh, event of the 60th anniversary. Our association was founded by Sir John Crawford in 1960 here in Canberra, and we uh, continued the tradition of bringing together friends, family, colleagues uh, who uh, celebrate the relationship, long standing relationship between our two countries and seek to, to honour traditions, continue robust conversations and uh, generate friendships across, across the Pacific. We're very grateful to the Australian Institute of International Affairs for hosting us here today. We think we share many interests in common and we hope that this will be the start of many other events we can do together. Um, Ambassador, it's a grey summer morning here in Canberra. I noted that um, we're very, it's very fortunate that we are actually able to gather in person and we're grateful for that opportunity in Australia. And also that we're not shrouded in smoke, which this time last year we were. So we're feeling very fortunate here um, and even more so to have your company on this Saturday morning. Without any further ado, I will hand over to back to Bryce. Thank you. <coughs> yes, indeed. Thank you, Lisa. And let me reiterate um, how pleased I am that our two organisations are working together to talk on uh, a very um, important topic, that is Australia's relations with the United States and um, the ambassador's view of uh, what has been a very tumultuous year um, and indeed an important year for US politics as well. Let me say a few words of introduction. Um, Arthur Sinodinas is, of course, Australia's ambassador to the United States of America. Um, as Lisa said, he took up his position there in February this year. Uh, he was previously Australia's Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science and was a Senator for New South Wales in the Australian Parliament. Um, he's over a, a career spanning four decades, he's dedicated his life to the advancement of Australia and its people. Um, he was the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, a position he held for, for nine years. He was a senior advisor, senior, senior economic advisor to John Howard uh, while he was in uh, opposition. And he started his Australian public service career in 1979 rising to the senior executive service in the Department of Treasury. So it's an honor to have um, Arthur here, or Ambassador Sinodinas here, um, as uh, he will give us his views on the United States. And I wanted to start um, really with a broad question about this year, 2020. It has indeed been um, a year of shocks and surprises. I don't think many of us here in Australia uh, would have thought in February that things could get much worse um, with bushfires, but um, along came March and April and uh, COVID. And of course, um, the 
the devastation to the economy that that has wrought um, globally. And we're now just now seeing the early stages of the vaccine rollout. So given these huge disruptions, given the economic downturns, I want to um, start firstly with um, a broad overview. Can you talk us through the view on all of this from where you sit in Washington, D.C.? Well, thanks, Bryce. And uh, first of all, thank you to you uh, at the Australian Institute of International Affairs and uh, for helming this discussion to my good friend, Lisa, for that introduction and to the AAA, um, which I have a lot to do with, as you can imagine, in my job here. And congratulations on the 60th anniversary. And uh, I wish I could have been at the Commonwealth Club because it meant I could have been in Canberra and I could have been in that wonderful relatively COVID-free environment that you've got. Um, going to the, the, this uh, question that you asked me, uh, uh, giving you an overview of the year, I, I guess when I got here, as Americans were talking about the bushfires in Australia. It was front page news. It was almost as if the whole country was on fire. And everywhere I went, even on airplanes, the first thing people would ask me when they heard I was an Australian was about the bushfires. When I went to present my credentials to President Trump a couple of days after I arrived, um, he wanted to talk about the bushfires, the backburning, environmental management of uh, bushfire areas, what's going to happen to the land later. Um, and I, had a, I was lucky to have a couple of ministerial visits. Peter Dutton came through and then Maurice Payne as foreign minister. But then within a few weeks in March, the pandemic hit. And so for me, this year has been about the pandemic, the biggest economic contraction since the depression, racial protests, and then a very long and very partisan election campaign. And then a very long or what seemed like an endless period of counting the vote and working out who had won. And of course, since then, Bryce, you've seen all these um, attempts to um, sort of uh, gainsay the result, uh, even now attempts to take a lawsuit through the Supreme Court. Um, but where we've ended up is at the end of the year, we're gonna have a change of administration. President-elect Biden uh, is going to be taking office, all other things being equal on the 20th of January. Um, so what this year has been for me is a massive learning curve about America in an election year, <clears throat> how seriously they take their freedoms. For example, during the pandemic, the states have very strong powers here. So even getting a coordinated response to COVID was a challenge in that environment. People take the constitution seriously, the first amendment on free speech, second amendment on gun rights. Um, so it's incredible just to see the way in which the system works the division of powers between the three arms of government, the administration, the Congress, the Supreme Court, the checks and balances. Um, so for me, I'd seen this from the outside, but to actually experience this from the inside and to see how politics basically overwhelmed everything. It overwhelmed COVID. It overwhelmed the response to the economic thing. It overwhelmed the racial situation. So we, we end the year with, as you alluded to, the hope that the vaccine will make things better next year. We've got to just get through the winter here. Um, <coughs> it's getting cold here now, unlike Canberra, hopefully. Um, and, but we're hoping we get through the winter by spring, we'll have a vaccine uh, and also um, people continuing to socially distance and mask and everything else, and we'll get through that. And as a result of that, the economy will then start to recover more, more sustainably. And as that happens, it'll be good for the global economy as well. Um, so it's a pretty tumultuous year. Uh, lots to potentially talk about. Lots of policy change on the way in a number of areas. So happy to go through all of that with you. Okay, fantastic. Um, we'll we'll be digging um, into a lot of those uh, those those issues soon. Um, I just want to remind everybody who's at home or where, wherever you are, um, if you do have any questions for the ambassador, there'll be an opportunity to put them uh, to him. Um, just type in your um, your question in the Q and A function 
uh, which should appear at the bottom of your screen. Now, um, I want to um, perhaps go a little bit narrower um, on the in the same direction that we're going and ask about um, how this has affected your role as ambassador. Um, you know, during the, the, the pandemic, um, I expect you're not getting out and about as much as you can um, or as much as you, you would have had, it, had, had, had there been normal circumstances. I mean, how does, how does COVID um, affect the sort of everyday life of the diplomat, as it were? Well, uh, in, in my case, uh, we put the embassy into lockdown in uh, mid-March. Uh, we essentially closed it down except for essential staff going in uh, and, of course, the passport and consular functions continuing. Um, and everybody else essentially working from home. We have a return to office plan. We've now back to about 30% occupancy at the embassy. I'm speaking to you from my home office. I'm lucky enough to have a residence where I can have a home office downstairs. The kids can have all their rooms upstairs and we can all sort of live with each other without getting too much on each other's nerves. But I've spent almost the whole period since the mi middle of March working from my home office. I've been out and about when I've had ministers here. Maurice Payne and Linda Reynolds were here for Osmin uh, a few months ago. But that was the first time, in fact, in a long time where I'd actually been in the city physically getting around. I've been around a bit since. During the summer period, we could take the car and drive a bit out of town. But again, avoid large crowds, go to areas which are relatively isolated. People at the embassy who want to break essentially book a cabin on a lake or by the seashore, drive there by car, minimize contact with other people and so on and so forth. So um, I've had to do most of my work, Bryce, virtually. Um, I've been to the Congress, I've been to the White House at various times, but um, I've had to be careful um, about all of that. And therefore where possible, where we get a choice, we prefer to do things virtually still. Uh, and, you know, it's been a great way to get to a lot of people. And in fact, uh, probably met more people virtually than I would have met if I'd been doing it all physically. Um, the, the other thing that it's done for me as a manager of people is better understand how remote working works in practice. What are the upsides? What are the downsides? Um, so I'm much more confident about all of that. And I think as we come out of the pandemic, more broadly in the workforce, it'll be interesting to see the extent to which people decide, for example, that they might work from home two or three days a week and the other two or three days go in the office. When it comes to overseas trips, they might only do one or two a year to catch up with people, not the sort of every month or every second month that some people have been used to in the past. Because even when we, I think, come out of the pandemic, because we've learned some new ways to work together, I think some of those will stick and it'll have interesting implications for work in central business districts and how that goes compared to working from home or in your local neighborhood, your local community and all that sort of thing. So I guess it's a bit like Stockholm syndrome. We've adapted to our circumstances and we make the best of it, um, but we're learning better about how to work together virtually. And we're also looking at ways we can encourage American companies to employ Australians to work from Australia I'm thinking particularly you know, of areas like Silicon Valley now, where a lot of people physically now want to get out of Silicon Valley and San Francisco and the Bay Area because it's getting very expensive. And they're looking to go to other parts of America. But we're also saying, also think about how you can work from Australia. It's very good. I think um, we're all adjusting. And I mean, we wouldn't have been able to have this event, for example, were it not for you know the changes that we've taken on board with the uh, with the pandemic, and it's um, there's been a silver lining for the AIIA, and that we're we're able to reach out to audiences that we haven't been able to before. So I, I hear you. Um, so um, I want to turn to politics now, which is probably what everybody is here for, um, and I <laughs> and I want to narrow it down a bit to talk about, um, of course, the incoming Biden administration. Um, we'll get to. Um, Australia-US relations in a minute. But first, I want you to talk a little bit about what you think the priorities of 
the Biden administration would, will be, um, particularly in foreign policy. Well, firstly, is foreign policy in general going to be a priority for the administration? And secondly, where what what foreign policy priorities will the administration have? If you pinned um, B Joe Biden to the wall, he would say that his number one, number two, number three priority at the moment would be to get through the pandemic, to get COVID under control. Um, when our prime minister wrote to the president-elect to congratulate him, we offered to provide information on our approach to COVID, um, not in a triumphalist way, but you know, lessons learned and all the rest of it. Uh, we, we passed that information on to the Trump administration as well, but we passed it on to Joe Biden because he needs to get COVID under control if he's got any chance of getting the economy to grow sustainably and then achieve all his other objectives. There is going to be a strong domestic focus. They want to invest in America big time in infrastructure, health, education, skills. They're very keen to do more on climate as well in that regard, a green sort of recovery. Um, so domestic will be very important, but every American president has to deal with foreign policy and he is very experienced when it comes to foreign policy. And from our point of view, that's very important because we want to be able to engage him in the Indo-Pacific. Now he says, and his people say they're very keen to engage on the Indo-Pacific, but the Europeans in particular will be really keen to kiss and make up. So I think we're gonna see a situation where we need to actively shape the agenda of this administration, this coming administration in the region, along with like-minded partners like Japan, India and, and the like. But his first priority will be the domestic economy. Uh, and so any trade agreements, he will enter into will be after he has, he believes, got the domestic economy uh, in better shape and America is more competitive. Okay, fantastic. Um, great. Um, now, um, I do want to turn to Australia um, and um, and the US relationship with Australia. I mean, what do you think are uh, points, of, uh, points of priority for the US administration? And are there any perhaps points of difference? Uh, people will of course be uh, thinking perhaps of uh, climate policy as, uh, as, a, as a major point of difference between Australia and uh, the United States under Biden. Um, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I think the, the, the first point is that um, the, the very strong feedback we get from people associated with the Biden camp, because at the moment we can't talk directly to Biden and his people because they're in transition and there can only be one government at a time. Uh, but they've made it very clear. They see the relationship with Australia, the alliance with Australia as very important to them in the region. Um, like a lot of people on both the Democrat and the Republican side of the aisle over here in the US, there's a lot of regard for Australia. So they regard the relationship as very important and very strong. Um, and they're very keen to work with us. But as I said before, we have got to shape that engagement in the region to, so that they are more involved because with the growing geostrategic competition between the US and China, what people in the region want is we want to get on with China, but we want the US engaged in the region as a bit of a guarantor of an open, inclusive and prosperous Indo-Pacific. Um, and that's something we're going to work on with them quite closely. There are defense and security aspects of that, how closely we work together, how intraoperable we are in various theaters. Um, on trade, we're very keen to get them to do more in the region. Uh, we're keen on a bilateral basis to negotiate a digital trade agreement with them. We've, we've done others in the region and then we want to bring those together to promote more uh, freedom of digital trade in the region. Uh, and then we see that as a precursor to trying to get the US to reconsider coming into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We think it's important for them to do that. Uh, at, at the moment, it's a bit like Hamlet without the prince. 
because if they're in there, it'll set high standards for the region. It'll um, set rules for the region and that will benefit us because we want a rules-based order which is fair to both large and small economies. The challenge of the growth of China as a great power is um, we don't want a situation where they feel that they can then just unilaterally set rules. We want a global rules-based order we can all live with and which is to the extent possible fair to both large, medium and smaller powers. So um, that's a challenge for us. Uh, the Biden people are saying all the right things about being focused on the region. They talk about being competitive with China. They realize there's a competition, but they also talk about identifying areas of cooperation, uh, some of which would include the pandemic, climate change, nuclear non-proliferation. Now, in respect of differences between us and the US, in a fundamental sense, not differences, but on areas like climate policy that you mentioned, uh, where we've adopted in recent times an investment approach, talking about our low emission technology roadmap and the investments that go with that, there's actually a lot of similarity between that and the sort of domestic investments that Joe Biden wants to make in terms of a green recovery in the US. So we're happy to talk about those overlaps. On issues like targets, where they're talking about uh, ambition on targets, we'll make it clear that those considerations are going on here about what we do next on targets. But as the Prime Minister made clear, um, it's a given that we'll have targets or further targets. The question is how you get there. And it's really talking with the Americans and others about the pathway to get there, given the characteristics of our different economies. So it's like all these things, as countries, we always have differences. We have differences with our friends, but these are differences that we can manage because we have a fundamentally similar outlook when it comes to values, what I call decent, humane, universal values, and we have very similar interests. Uh, yes, we do. And of course, we are alliance partners. And next year is the 70th anniversary of uh, the ANZUS Treaty. So that's probably a good point now to talk about that. Um, I wonder if you can talk about specifically what are the what are the prospects for uh, cooperation under that treaty? Um, on one hand, uh, ANZUS is stronger than ever. Um, but there may well be a risk that we take the treaty for granted. Um, You've often talked about uh, uh, ANZUS in terms of not just interests, but values. Can you expand on that um, a little bit, perhaps? Sure, thanks. Um, well, I think ANZUS was founded in part on uh, shared values, the sort of values that have underpinned the global rules-based order since uh, the end of World War II. And one of the things I'm fond of saying, I said this in my final speech in the Senate, is that one of the greatest acts of enlightened self interest in world history was the US putting together after World War II, this global rules-based order, which encompassed both friends and foes and created the basis for the peace and prosperity we've had ever since. And in that context, uh, ANZUS came about because we shared a similar outlook in terms of values and interests, particularly in our own region. Uh, you're right, it continues to be relevant. It continues to be vital and dynamic and evolving. Um, essentially, the direction we're evolving in is greater interoperability, greater integration, particularly within the Indo-Pacific. Um, a couple of years ago, with the help of Senator McCain, there was legislation passed which made Australia and the UK part of what's called the National Technological Industrial Base here in the US. And that legislation means that we're treated more as domestic partners almost rather than other countries when it comes to access to their technology base and to work together. There's some red tape we're trying to reduce in how we access that base. But by working together in that way, uh, we can promote our defense industry and our common defense interests by having equipment and strategies which um, mean that we can work very closely together. And of course, what's happening uh, in the region now is that other groupings are coming to the fore, including the Quad, Australia, US, Japan, and India. And all of these are adding to our capacity 
to uh, cooperate on security and other issues. Um, one of the areas we're particularly keen to expand our uh, cooperation on is information warfare, cyber security. This is an area which is really growing in importance because a lot of what's happening in the world today is not overt military conflict, but it's what's called gray zone activities, which is activities which are below the threshold of actual military conflict, but where an adversary is attempting to gain an advantage in some way. And we've seen through cyber attacks and other things, what this potentially looks like. So a treaty like ANZUS adapts to this world as it changes. But one of the interesting things about the Biden administration is that while they talk about the importance of alliances and the military side of things, they see that as a last resort, as we do. In other words, they're going to put more focus on diplomacy, building up or rebuilding the State Department, and more focus, I think, on their soft power in the world. They talk about not the example of their power, but the power of their example. So they talk, for example, about having a summit of democracies early on to bring major democracies, liberal democracies together, so we can, um, I think, work more closely to promote the sort of values and interests we were talking about before. Okay, very good. Um, now we do, um, I am seeing some questions come through. So if you are, um, if you are at home and uh, you have a question, remember to type it through the Q&A function. Um, for those of you here in our audience, uh, put up your hand once the conversation or our uh, bilateral conversation has finished and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll ask you, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get you to ask your own question. Um, I do want to focus a little bit more on a question I asked before about foreign policy priorities, however. There is a sense um, that perhaps um, Biden won't be as focused on this region, Asia, Indo-Pacific, whatever you want to call it, um, and may well be focused uh, elsewhere. I mean, uh, he may put priorities on the transatlantic relationship or um, the relationship with the Middle East. Where do you see Asia in particular um, uh, within the scope of his approach to foreign policy in general? Or the well, other, if you like. The, the sort of people who are around Biden and who advise him on foreign policy and security policy, I think are very conscious that um, things have changed since they were last in office in the Obama administration and particularly um, the relationship with China has become more overtly competitive than it was before. And I think that will drive a lot of their engagement in the region. But the point we would make to them as we have made to the Trump administration is don't just look at the region through the prism of the relationship with China or say to countries in the region, you've got to choose between the US or China. Many countries in the region want the security of having the US in the region, but they want to be able to get on with China. So you have to be careful how you um, present all of this to countries in the region. Uh, I'm thinking of ASEAN, for example, and the way they operate. They're very reluctant to often to come out and uh, be very overt about these issues. But, that, but that's fine from, from our point of view. What we would do, as I mentioned before, is we would encourage the US to keep developing the quad arrangement that I mentioned before. And we're investing more in Southeast Asia now in various ways. Uh, we're talking to the Americans about what that means in practice and therefore how do we work in more in concert in Southeast Asia and also in the Southwest Pacific. Um, I think their attitude will be that they have trusted partners like Australia, Japan, India and others, Singapore comes to mind in the region. Um, and there'll be plenty to keep them focused on the region because China is not going to go away. China is going to continue developing. China is going to continue to be assertive, to be aggressive in promoting what it sees as its interests. So this will engage the administration. And our role here in Washington at the embassy is to how do we help shape their engagement in our region? You're right that there will be focus on the transatlantic relationship because um, there have been issues with NATO and the rest, but that will work itself out. But 
if you talk to countries in Europe now, if you talk to France, you talk to Germany, you talk to Holland, they are all talking about Indo-Pacific strategies as well. So there's a lot of focus in the EU as well about relationship with China. The UK is also now looking at its Indo-Pacific strategy. They're sending the carrier, the Queen Elizabeth, out to the Indo-Pacific next year as part of a carrier group to send a message about their commitment to the region. They've even raised the prospect of joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the UK, because they realize the extent to which the center of gravity of the global economy and global politics is shifting to the Asia Pacific. And Australia is at the front line of a lot of that. Okay, very good. And of course, there are uh, other partners in the region like Japan. Um, yeah. Uh, where, where we're already seeing uh, quite uh, substantial uh, moves towards cooperation there. Uh, does that, I mean, do you, do you, does that factor into your discussions in, uh, in Washington, the, 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 uh, the relationship there with Japan? Yes, um, Japan is probably our most like-minded partner in the region, Australia's. And therefore, yeah, we work closely together. And that also means working closely here in, in Washington in our messaging to the administration. It doesn't have to be identical messaging, but the point is working together um, to shape the engagement of the US administration. Uh, there are other partners in the region, Republic of Korea, who operate in a slightly different way, but most of their objectives are essentially the same, really. They walk a bit of a tightrope because of the situation in North Korea. But again, these are partners we work closely with we're keen for the administration to understand the challenges facing Indonesia as Indonesia goes forward, because Indonesia is a big country, big prospects, but faces some big challenges. So we're keen with the administration and others to make sure that Indonesia can get through the pandemic and put itself on a more sustainable economic recovery path, because it has a large population and it's one of the developing economies that's been hard hit by the pandemic. In fact, globally, for the global economy, one of the challenges coming out of the pandemic will be that developed economies will come out of it and recover relatively well, but developing countries, particularly those with large debt burdens, are going to have a challenge. And now there's a lot of work going on on how we relieve some of that debt burden. Right. Um, now, remember, everybody, if you want to ask a question, uh, just type it into the Q&A. Um, now, um, uh, we'll come to questions soon, but I just want to, we, we, we came in on Biden, and um, I think I'm, I'm going to ask you to be perhaps a little bit uh, less diplomatic than you might want to be uh, on the outgoing Trump administration. Um, obviously, Trump <laughs> is still uh, the, the president of the United States, but um, I wonder if you might reflect uh, on the four years um, and perhaps uh, talk about whether you see the Trump administration as something that has fundamentally changed American politics or not. Um, going, well, will it change American politics going forward? And in that light, um, is Trump uh, a sort of symptom of something deeper that's going on in US politics or is it an aberration? Yeah, good question. And um, let me start at the, the end of that question, because I don't think he's an aberration. I think he himself is unique in the link he's been able to create between himself and a large part of the American electorate. But he didn't create the circumstances which brought him about. Those circumstances, I think, in part were created by perception in parts of the US that, you know, with... Um, real wages not rising very much for decades, um, particularly in those areas which used to be pretty competitive, but which have been battered by globalization. The perception that prosperity increasingly has been concentrated on the West Coast and the East Coast, that the flyover states, as they're called, the Midwest and other areas have been missing out um, by comparison. There, there, there's a large group of Americans who felt they've been left behind by economic growth and development in recent decades. Some people who have been uh, concerned at the sort of cultural change they're seeing in America, demographic change, 
urbanization increasing, that's exacerbating the rural city divide. Uh, in terms of the demographic side of things, it is a relatively young population compared to say Europe and Russia and Japan. And so you have a bit of a generational divide as well. Um, so what's happening here is um, there's, a, there's just a feeling that different parts of the country are going in different directions. And I think he was able to tap into that and make some Americans who felt left behind that he could restore, I think, a version of America that existed decades ago when America was on top. I remember when he signed some legislation to authorize a pipeline between the US and Canada, he held up the executive order and he said, and we'll make the steel in America just like we used to. So in other words, a lot of it was about recreating this version of America that existed in some previous generation or generations. Um, and so the instruments he used to help create that were also instruments that harked back to a, a, a new era, a, a different era. For example, the tariff instruments that were used, particularly against China. Uh, whereas, you know, we thought we'd all move beyond the tariff wars and all the rest of it. I mean, the things that he's done well is there's no doubt he stoked up the economy and that further increased American employment and growth. And barring COVID, he would probably have been re-elected. If you go back to his State of the Union address at the beginning of the year, where he talked about the state of the economy, that was his stump speech for the election. Then COVID came along and essentially wrecked that. And I think the problem was for him, the challenge was always, he was wanting to recreate that narrative and yet he had to deal with this unforeseen set of circumstances so it was almost like trying to do two things at the one time that's why there were the mixed messaging and then when you look at the federal state divide on on COVID you saw how sometimes the federal federal government would assert itself and other times it would say no let the states deal with this so I don't think he's an aberration in that sense. I don't think there are many, many politicians around who are as effective as he is in tapping into those moods and articulating them. The other thing about him is if you watch him on the, out on the stump, he is very good at communicating in clear, simple terms with his fellow Americans. There's no jargon. It's almost conversational. And it, it just creates that link that, yeah, this guy's not from Washington. He's going to drain the swamp. He's a businessman. He knows how to run a business. He will know how to run the economy. And if you look at some work that was done on people who voted for him in this election, they were the sort of, often they were non-college educated white people, although there were other increasingly Latinos and African-Americans who voted for him as well. But they voted on the basis, oh, the economy was doing pretty well pre-COVID, so we felt better off. We don't blame him for COVID. COVID was an act of nature, it happened. Um, and by the way, we're a bit uncomfortable with a lot of the cultural change that's occurring because we think it means other people may get ahead at our expense. Great, okay. Um, thank you for that. So not an aberration, we can expect to see him back in 2024, maybe. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> On that, um, what he's done in recent times uh, by not conceding the election is he's maintained the rage. He's raised since the election over $200 million. So he's, he, he's, you're right, he is keeping his options open for 2024. And that's creating a dilemma for the Republican Party because there are people in the Republican Party who want to move beyond Trump, but they want to keep Trump's base. So at the moment, their concern is that if he's hanging around, he'll be able to run people against them in their primaries and essentially get his candidates up using his base. So there's a bit of a tussle uh, going on there about what the future of the Republican Party is. But America has changed. Countries always change. Nothing ever goes back to what it was. Um, and so there'll be some Republicans who think 
If we just use the Trump formula, that's the way back to office. There'll be other Republicans, I think, who will realize, well, actually, you know, we've got to find a way of appealing across the aisle. And what's interesting about Biden, one of the people who he's appointed to his White House is a former congressman who will be responsible for business and public engagement. And part of his role is to appeal to conservatives. Biden is making a point. I want to appeal across the aisle and to some of those people who voted for Donald Trump. Okay, great. Well, that's, uh, that, that's it for, from, from our conversation, if you like. And I now want to open the floor to, uh, to questions. If you're here in the audience, uh, can you raise your hand now just to give me an indication of who has a question? Yep, great. Okay, we do have some questions from the audience. But first, we'll go to our online audience. And I'll go to Penny Wensley, great supporter of the Institute and a, a fellow, actually. Um, she asks, the history of US engagement and commitment to the UN and multilateralism has varied considerably, with the Democrats usually more activist and supportive. How energetic do you think the new administration will be at or within the UN? And can you tell us something about their nominated ambassador to the UN? Well, first of all, great to hear from Penny and glad she's doing well. Um, and Penny is right. They will be more active in multilateral institutions. They've made that clear. They want to work more closely with allies in terms of how we um, staff multilateral institutions, the sort of people we put up, the senior positions there. Uh, they've made it clear that they want to reinvigorate multilateral institutions. Uh, President Biden wants to go back into the Paris Agreement from day one, uh, re-enter the World Health Organization. He wants to be active uh, in the United Nations system. His nominee uh, for the UN uh, is a woman of color whose name escapes me for the moment. It's a double barrel name, so I'd have to practice it. But um, she is a strong advocate of working with other people and the point that Joe Biden has made is that by having a diverse and inclusive cabinet, that he accepts America as it is and the world as it is, uh, and he will have no hang-ups about that. So what I think that means in practice in terms of their multilateral engagement is that they will be there, they will be present. What this means on policy is that, for example, they'll be active on human rights. And of course, that can be a two-edged sword because when you're dealing with international relations, if you become uh, very exercised about human rights, you can find all sorts of examples in all sorts of countries to get exercised about, but you then have to also balance that with your relations with different countries. So it doesn't necessarily become an issue which overwhelms individual relationships, country or bilateral relationships, but they will be very active in this context. And on areas like reproductive rights and the, and the like, they will be more of a, mind to us on all of that, which will make it easier dealing with some of those issues in the UN and other contexts. Okay, great. We have a question now from one of our um, AAA friends. So I'll ask her to come up and introduce herself and ask her question. Hello, my name is Rachel Mink. I'm an American. My parents live very close to you. They're in Fairfax. Um, so I was wondering what it's been like since the current administration has refused to concede and what that has meant for your duties as an ambassador and in making any kind of progress in foreign policy in the last month or so. Well, thanks very much, Rachel, for that question. And uh, great to, that you're there in Australia. It's, those people to people links are very important. Um, look, uh, the point I've made to people here at the embassy is that the administration is the administration till the 20th of January. They are the government. So we continue to deal with them professionally, courteously, uh, and where policy issues are raised, we continue to deal with them according to current policy settings in Australia. As I may have mentioned before, we can't talk directly to Joe Biden and his team, the people he's announced, until after the 20th of January, because there is only one government in office at a time, uh, and they don't want to be accused 
of um, dealing with foreign governments at cross purposes to the administration. We've been able to get on with business with the current administration. We continue to do briefings. Um, we continue to pursue policy agendas that have been in place for a while around Osmin and other things. So we're getting on with business as usual and, uh, and they've acted professionally towards us and we reciprocate that. Okay, very good. Let's go back again to our, um, our Q&A online. Um, we have a question here about, I guess, the practical uh, considerations uh, of uh, working in an embassy now, not only in a COVID environment, but in a post-COVID environment as well. Um, with the changes in office practices and greater, this is from John Hayton, with the changes in office practices and greater willingness to operate virtually, does Australia need the same level of presence in its embassies? Are we going to see radical staff restructuring in DFAT? <laughs> It's a, a good question. Uh, in some ways, a very Canberra question because the APS is always, you know, on the front line of these things. Um, look, the, the truthful answer is time will tell. My own impression is no, it won't lead to great changes in the number of personnel on the ground because, frankly, um, in a post COVID environment, particularly getting out and about, visiting different parts of the country interacting with people on the ground where they live is very important in getting a real feel for how the country works. There are some functions, maybe processing functions, you can do more remotely. And we've already been looking at those sorts of options in various contexts anyway. But the thing that you can't do from Canberra or from Australia is build up local knowledge in particular. And that's very important when you're dealing with the more complex cases, for example, in the passport and consular or home affairs sort of environments, um, or build up the personal relationships, which are so important with people in the Congress, the White House and everywhere else, and then being able to encourage those people to come to Australia to see how we do things. So having that diplomatic presence is important. We're um, a window on Australia for the US, and that's done best when we're here uh, and, but as I say, we'll see what COVID means about some functions that at the periphery maybe are better done elsewhere. But having physical diplomats in place is a, always a good idea. And the reality is that our footprint, the diplomatic footprint of Australia is relatively lean compared to many other countries, including smaller countries when you look at it on a per capita basis. Okay, very good. We have, um, I'll just grab my coffee. We have a, uh, another question from the floor. So Hello, thank you very much for your talk. It's so informative. I have a question to ask about the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. As you know, Australia doesn't have nuclear weapons. We are unlikely to get nuclear weapons. We are one of the few countries in the world which hasn't signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. There's a push again internationally for it to be signed, especially with a new Biden administration. What chance do you think we have of Australia signing that treaty? Because it really does seem appropriate. Um, that's, that's more a question for my bosses back home. Um, I would say that we, we've acted in a way consistent with that treaty, with the sort of safeguards that we put on uranium exports and, and the like, but that's really a question uh, for back home. Um, I remember years ago, we've had, had the Canberra Commission, we had all these other ways of looking at how we eliminate nuclear weapons and the rest. One interesting thing that's happened in recent times is because of climate change, there's been a bit of a push on nuclear power for civilian use. Uh, and uh, that's raised some interesting issues in its own regard. But that's more a question for my uh, betters back home. Okay, uh, we'll go again to the Q&A. Um, we've got one from Nick. Um, it's one you're gonna have to use your interpretive powers on, I think. He says, it has been said that other nations want to garner Australia's political support on foreign policy issues and prevent Australia from siding with Washington. 
What can we do to ensure our Australian values are not up for negotiation as we continue to grow our relationship with other nations? Yes. Um, well, look, the important thing is, is to do things based on principle. So, for example, um, if you look at the South China Sea, uh, what we've said there is that there should be freedom of navigation because that is consistent with the international rules, the, the law of the sea and, and the rest, and that countries that have um, competing claims on islands in the South China Sea should resolve them in a, a way consistent with international law. Um, when it's come to things like whether Huawei and, so, and such telco should operate in Australia, what we've said on principle is we don't want a situation where a telco potentially is a conduit for information to go back to the intelligence services of another country. So, and even when we recently passed in the Australian Parliament, the, the foreign relations bill to do with certain foreign arrangements, um, that was not country specific, it was country agnostic. We do this on principle. And so as long as we are doing things on principle based on our values and are being consistent in doing that, I don't think other countries should say, well, they're doing this because they're anti us or whatever. The fact that some of this means that we may do things that China, for example, does not like. Well, our answer to that is we're doing it based on our values and our principles. And that's our national interest. And we act accordingly. Very good. Okay, we have um, one final question from the floor, and it's from Cam Hawker, who's well known to the Institute. He was the president of the ACT branch, uh, and he's now involved with the AAA, um, and in fact, uh, helps to set up a lot of this uh, today. So I'll pass things over to him for a final question. Hello, Ambassador. Um, my question, in a sense, follows on from, from the previous question and your remark about that nexus on values and principles and also interests. And, and the question's really around economic decoupling. So I was last in the US about a year ago and I was struck by how pronounced the narrative on uh, decoupling was there. I thought at that point it was probably further down the road than we were. And I think since then we've gone down the road and you know, China arguably has helped us along the way with, with um, you know, some of the trade tension that's going on. But like, how far do you see this going, really, is, is my question. How do we balance, you know, defending our values, um, which is unarguably a legitimate thing to do and in the national interest, but also protecting our economic interests and the fact that China remains, you know, a, a very key partner for us in a trade sense? Thanks very much, Cam, for that, for that question. Um, I think if you talk to people here and elsewhere, um, no one foresees a complete economic decoupling between, say, the West, in inverted commas, and China. What we do see is that in areas around IT, technology, um, data, and the like, um, that's the area probably, uh, yeah, what we call the splinter net. Yeah, the, the idea of the internet being balkanized because of the different ways that some countries uh, operate when it comes to the uh, internet. Um, areas of critical technology, which have a national security dimension is another area. And what we say in areas like that to the US is that if you're thinking of decoupling, work with trusted partners. So we get the benefit of working together on that science and that technology. And so for us, it's really a judgment about areas where there's a national security dimension. And that's increasingly the case. And this is why, you know, when we talk about economic considerations versus national security considerations, when it comes to our international relationships, we can't silo them the way we used to, because there are some areas where they do now overlap. And also we don't want to send a message that our economic interests are such that we're prepared to potentially subvert some of our principles that are consistent with our national interest to maintain those economic interests. So for us, supply chains around areas of critical technology, these include frontier technologies, artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing, hypersonics, space, all of that. These are all areas that we wanna work um, 
together with uh, the US. Okay, very good. Um, we're, we're coming up uh, to our time. Um, uh, I, Bryce, yes. can I just add to an answer I, I, I gave before? The, the original nuclear non-proliferation treaty we ratified in 1973. Okay, very good. Um, we, we haven't, what we've done since is not signed on to some of the UN resolutions around banning, I think, nuclear weapons and the like. Okay, so I just okay. wanted to clarify that. Very good. Very important clarification. Now, um, what I uh, what I would like to do is give you the opportunity to. I mean, if you have a message, uh, we are coming to the end of the webinar. So, if you have um, anything you would like to say finally to the Australian people watching this, or perhaps people in, in Washington or around the world uh, watching this webinar, is there anything on the? Uh, Australia-America relationship or otherwise that you would like to look, look I, I think the thing I would say is that um, this narrative of American decline, which has become a bit more prevalent in recent times, um, I think is misplaced. What strikes you when you're over here is that this is a very dynamic place. It can look, particularly in election year, a very divisive place. But there's a lot of resilience here. And if you go through the history of the US, whenever it's looked like it's on the back foot, um, it seems to have recovered its footing and gone on to be bigger and better than before. Uh, and even on issues like the racial protests that we saw this year, what that has led is a very strong movement within the US. And President Biden or President-elect Biden exemplifies this of saying on these issues, what are the structural things we can do to address entrenched inequality. And if you look at the people he's brought into his cabinet, they're all committed to how do they improve the prospects of those who really feel like they're not getting a proper, I think, share of the American dream, if I can put it like that. So I think we should be confident about what America can do. It's still at the frontier of innovation and technology. One of the jobs I've got here is how we work closely with the Americans to promote that science and technology frontier and working there together and what benefits Australia gets out of that. So I'm quite optimistic about where the relationship goes and it's underpinned by very strong people to people links and having organizations like the AAA, the Canberra chapter and others doing that on the ground is really important. And uh, those people to people links are the ultimate ballast to the relationship uh, we get each other, even though sometimes we don't get each other's jokes or some of each other's language, uh, but we get each other. It's organic, the way we can come together and work together. And there's a lot of good things still to do. And I'm really optimistic about what we can do over the next four years. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, round of applause. <laughs> It's, it's been great having you here in Canberra at the AAA, and if we can help out in any any way uh, that uh, about the, the people people contacts that you just mentioned, let us know. Um, now I'm going to turn things over to Bill Mason, who is the president of the AAA, for his final words. Bill, uh, thank you, Bryce, and uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Sinodinas. It was a wonderful presentation you gave us this morning. I think it gives us all here in the room and on the Zoom um, throughout Canberra, great confidence that we have such an experienced representative in uh, Washington at this particular time. I mean, we've, we've had a, you know, some people say we've had a year to forget, but perhaps we've had a year to remember. And uh, it gives me great confidence to hear um, our ambassador in, in Washington present the future. Uh, he talked about perhaps the Biden administration would return to the power of uh, the US example in the world. Uh, I think we'd all like to uh, support that. He talked about the fact that in 2020, the center of gravity uh, may well move to the Indo-Pacific. I mean, these are things to look forward to. Um, so Ambassador Sinodinas, uh, if you were here, we'd be presenting you a bottle, with a bottle of uh, Australian wine. <laughs> A freedom wine, of course, freedom wine. <laughs> and, and I'd like to mention that uh, the US Embassy has been investing in Canberra wine fairly solidly in the last uh, few days. So we, we, appreciate, we appreciate their support. 
So ladies and gentlemen, uh, both in the audience and out there in Zoom land, could you join with me and thank uh, Ambassador Sinodinas for his excellent presentation this morning. Thanks very much, Bill. Thank you. And it just comes to me now to uh, make some quick closing remarks. I'd like to thank uh, some very important people, in particular to commence um, uh, with Cameron Hawker, a former, uh, currently an AAA uh, uh, committee member, put a lot of work into arranging this together with um, uh, Bryce Wakefield. Uh, Cam, of course, is a former president of the AC ACT chapter of the AA, uh, the Australian Institute of International Affairs in, in Canberra, and he's worked very uh, constructively with uh, Bryce um, Wakefield, and we appreciate Bryce's uh, excellent contribution today. So let's thank Bryce for that as well. Now I'd just like to uh, wish you all a happy Christmas. So we've had our Christmas brunch here this morning in uh, Stephen House. Uh, I'd like to wish you all um, the compliments of the season and to Ambassador Sinodinas the same in Washington. And uh, we are certainly very focused on the people to people links here in the AAA. Um, and we want to uh, develop those even further into 2020. And we have a number of activities uh, that we will be putting in place. So let's hope we see you all again in 2021. Thank you. Thank you.